Amen. We have a good service this morning. I really hope you enjoyed it. And what a, it was just a blessing. I heard so many comments from people. And, um, you know, the, the man that came forward tonight, this morning, he's here tonight. And Jerry, is that right? Tracy. Tracy. How did I get Jerry? I'm sorry. Tracy. Okay, now I surely won't forget now. So, Tracy, we're glad you're here and glad you're part of the fellowship here. Well, by the time I'm finished, we are finished with Christmas, you will be worn out, maybe, on some of these Christmas sermons. However, the more I study this, the more material there is. It just seems to be an unlimited amount of material and truths. So tonight I will start in Luke chapter 1, and I want to talk to you tonight about how great our joy is. How great our joy is. We have, if there's anything we need in this world, it's joy. We have so much discouraging news in the world. I have to do a media fast every now and then and just avoid hearing the news uh, lest I'll become depressed at world problems and problems in our own nation and in our own city. But with Jesus, there is a reason to be joyful. And so tonight I want to share with you some thoughts that I have about the joy that Christ brings. First, joy surrounded the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 1 is a story about the coming of John the Baptist. And we know that John the Baptist paved the way for Jesus. John's parents were Zachariah and Elizabeth. Zachariah was part of the priestly division of the day, and he had been elected to go into the temple and burn incense. And when he was in the temple burning incense, an angel of the Lord appeared, and he was afraid. Well, in verse 12, if you would read with me, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. Well, the person who was to introduce Jesus was brought to this world with the word joy. He will be a joy and a delight to you. Well, Zechariah was excited. And then later on, go down to verse uh, 43. We see joy again. Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. So Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins. And Mary told the news. And she said, Elizabeth said, But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So once again, Zechariah was filled with joy. <laughs> Elizabeth was filled with joy. Mary was filled with joy. And John the Baptist kicked really hard when Mary came in and told the news that she was expecting the Messiah. Now, go to, and then Mary breaks into song right there in verse 46. Turn the page over to verses 57 through 59. Elizabeth was older. Verse 57 says, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. So we have, we have joy in Jesus hasn't even been born yet. And then once again, this morning I talked about the shepherds. Look there in verse chapter 2, verse 10. The angel of the Lord told the shepherds, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, 
In the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So we have more joy. Then in verse 13, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God. Once again, more joy. Mary, Elizabeth, Zechariah, the shepherds, the wise men, the angels, all these people, the Bible uses the word joy or rejoice with their connection to the birth of Christ. The only person that's not connected with joy in the birth of Christ was King Herod and the innkeeper. But the, the in, there's no record that the innkeeper knew that Mary was about to give birth to Jesus. But Herod knew it. So of the people who knew that Jesus was the Messiah, all were excited except for Herod. So there was joy surrounding the birth of Christ. If you do a simple word study in a concordance of the word joy, you, you, just, you just won't believe the number of times joy and rejoice comes right beside Jesus or Christ or Lord or God. Well, we also see that during his earthly ministry, Jesus brought joy. Jesus was human and he experienced human emotions just like us. He was happy, he was sad. At times he was filled with uh, grief and so on, but for some reason it seems that we tend to forget the joyful side of Jesus. And as I read the scripture, it seems to me that the main emotion that Jesus displayed throughout his earthly life was that of joy. There's a theologian, a writer named R.C. Sproul. I've read some of his books. He answers this question. Somebody wrote him and asked, did Jesus ever laugh? What do the scriptures tell us about his character and his sense of humor? And he says this, I've heard some people answer this question in the negative by saying that laughter is always a sign of frivolity and a thinly veiled attempt to make light of things that are sober. They say that life is a sober matter. Jesus is described as a man of sorrows. He's described as one who was acquainted with grief. He walked around with enormous burdens upon him. And that, those are true statements. Then he goes on to talk about the humor of Jesus in his teachings, which would really make a great study. The puns that he used, the sarcasm, the exaggerations, the jokes, all of these things translated into English seem a little difficult to us to understand because something's lost in the translation into English, but it's there. And so he continues, in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, for example, in Ecclesiastes, we're told that certain things are appropriate at certain times. There's a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to build, a time to tear down. There's a time to dance, there's a time to sing, a time to laugh, and a time to cry. And since God has, in his seasons, appointed appropriate times for laughter, and Jesus always did what was appropriate. It would, it would seem to me that when it was time to laugh, he laughed. Now, there's not a specific verse that says Jesus laughed. But there are verses that tells us that Jesus was filled with joy. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 people to share the good news. They returned with joy and said, even the demons submit to us. In Jesus' name. Look in verse 21. At that time, upon hearing this report, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Jesus sent out 72 simple people, and they all came back excited about what they were able to do with the power of Jesus. Now think about how the miracles of Jesus must have brought joy. Healing the blind and the mute. Healing the lepers. I just can't imagine a solemn healing. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine a healing happening without joy. Jesus healed uh, lepers. He healed a lame man and uh, one of the scriptures that comes to my mind is he went walking and leaping and what? Praising God. Rejoicing for what Jesus had done. Jesus healed 
paralyzed people. I cannot, I cannot imagine joy being absent from the, the healing of the woman, the bleeding woman, or the healing of Peter's wife, or the healing with the man with dropsy, or the healing of the man with the withered hand, or the healing of the centurion's servant. And as Jesus passes through one area, all the people who touched his cloak were healed. I can't imagine it happening without joy. And then we have... Then we have the biblical record of the exorcisms where Jesus cast demons out and then all of a sudden people were in their right mind. I cannot imagine it happening without joy. And then the resurrection of the dead. Who owns the dead? Who owns death? Jesus owns it. And so he resurrected Lazarus. And then the resurrection of the dead at the time of the crucifixion is that they, 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 they came out of the ground and marched through the streets. All of these things, all of these things brought joy to people. And then think about Jesus' control over nature when he told the Sea of Galilee, peace be still. Can you imagine the joy of being on this ship, tossing and turning? I was on a small boat one time in the ocean, 64 foot long boat that got caught up in a storm uh, and I'm telling you now, that was a scary thing. And I remember thinking about Jesus and the disciples. And when Jesus said, peace be still, and then instantly everything was placid. Can you imagine the joy? Even the laughter that may have happened? There's Jesus. He's doing his thing again. Well, Luke 19 verse 37 tells us this. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Jesus bought, brought joy at the resurrection. Matthew 28 tells us that so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Now those sound like contradictory emotions. Afraid yet filled with joy and they ran to tell the disciples. And then the disciples were startled. They were frightened when they saw Jesus. They thought he, they saw a ghost and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's, it is I, touch, and, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands. He showed them his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and, excite and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence because a ghost wouldn't want anything to eat. And so... It, the scripture says it happened with joy and amazement. And in the book of Acts, we see that the church experienced lots of joy. Excitement for each day. What is going to happen next in the church? And this went on for quite some time. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great a cloud of such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so no doubt. The life that Jesus lived brought joy to the world that the world had never known. There's an artist named Ralph Kozak. I had a picture that we weren't able to show uh, because the system is the computer's not working right. But Ralph Kozak is a Christian who saw a drawing of Jesus laughing in the 1970s. He just saw this drawing. And he's an artist, so he decided to take this simple drawing and draw his own version of it and turn it into a color painting. So Ralph was inspired to communicate the joyful Jesus in, the, in a world where, the, where art depicts him as a person without emotion. And so Ralph takes this as a calling in his life. He's an older man now, and he says, 
I believe that the visual form of art is a valid expression of worship to God and that it can minister to us, reflecting God's love and joy. I saw some promotional material about Ralph and his picture of the laughing Jesus. And it said, Ralph loves to paint Jesus laughing. All he needs is a brush, some paint, and a place to stand. His joy and enthusiasm are clearly visible as he paints the picture. Like a concert pianist who has no need of sheet music, Ralph does not need a picture reference to paint Jesus laughing. He's painted originals countless times all over the country in different places for years. And, and the picture itself has been reproduced a million times. The laughing Jesus. So when you get home, Google the laughing Jesus and you'll see the picture of it. And next, the joy of Christ should fill all Christians. Now, this is not to say that we won't have difficult times, because we will. All Christians will have difficult times. For example, I read a book about a Chinese man who was persecuted for his belief in Jesus. His name is Father Yun. And he wrote a book called The Heavenly Man because that's what people called him. And in his book, he writes about his conversion experience. He writes about the severe persecution that he has faced as a Christian under the Chinese government. And the persecution uh, for him has been quite severe. He was in a forced labor camp for a very long time. Just one of the many forms of torture that he went through where he was forced to move heavy rocks in the most brutal weather conditions. Another time... His skin was scraped raw, and he was forced to swim through raw sewage after being beaten. But as he writes, anybody who reads Brother Young's book, you can't put it down because of the joy that this man felt because he was so convinced that Jesus was with him all the time. He was filled with joy because of how he was able to tell other prisoners and pris prison guards about Jesus. One day... In one of the many jails where he stayed, Brother Yun saw the, the jail gates open. And there was a time where they would let the prisoners just walk around. And it was unusual for this gate to be open. And he decided to walk toward the gate and see if anyone noticed because he didn't have anything to lose. The guards were standing there smoking. They didn't notice him. So he walked right out of the gate and into freedom. Now, Many people have found Brother Yun's book to be sensational. Some people criticize it as being fiction. Some say that he's hurt the cause of Christ by writing a book of lies. But, but it seems to me, when I read his book and read about criticism of his book, is that people have a problem with the overall tone of joy when he's being persecuted. And I didn't find his book to be unbelievable. If anything, it was a sobering reality of what this man has faced because of the cause of Christ and the joy that he had because of that. Now, Paul, in the Bible, he rejoiced when he was persecuted. People thought he was crazy, just like people thought Brother Young was crazy. And it defines, defies human reason that a suffering person could experience such joy. And this is correct because it does defy human reason. <laughs> but we do not serve human reason, do we? No. We serve a living Savior that started out as a poor baby in a manger. And the joy that he brought to the world when he was born, or even before he was born, is the same Savior that brings the same joy to us today. A friend of mine in her 20s named Brittany lost her husband in the war on terror. Her husband, Aaron Grider, was a strong Christian. He had joy going into battle because he had absolutely no doubt that God had selected him to save lives by fighting terrorism. And now his young widow, Brittany, who is herself a very joyful person, she started a foundation, the Aaron Grider Foundation, in his memory to help families who've lost someone in the war. Such reason makes no sense on the human level. But Jesus provides joy in the most unusual circumstances. I've been to many funerals where there was joy. 
not because someone had died, but because everyone there knew that this person's suffering was over and that this person was now rejoicing in the arms of Jesus. I see Herb and June joking about their chemo dates as they fight cancer. <laughs> and on the human level, none of this makes any sense. All of these people, Brother Yun, the Apostle Paul, Brittany Grider, grieving people at funerals, Herb and June. All of these people have the right to be angry and sad at what's been thrown their way. But because of Jesus, they have joy. And the skeptic who says that this is just a mental condition is right. It's a mental condition because of a spiritual condition of a Jesus who brings joy. I think that the sign of a, of a sign of Christian maturity is finding joy in the fact that this life is only temporary and that we are just pilgrims passing through and once it's over, it's over. So let's have joy on the voyage. If we forget the joyful side of Jesus, we turn Christianity into nothing more than a list of do nots. There's a list of, there is a, there's a group of Christians in our world today. They're not in any one specific denomination, but they're out there. And these people will just suck the joy right out of being a Christian. I have this internal detector, Terry. I mean, when I come in contact with these people, this, this detector just starts beeping because I've been, I've been around enough of them who throw cold water on people's joy. And I avoid, I avoid joyless Christians like the plague. And I challenge you to avoid joyless Christians and spend your time rejoicing with joyful Christians. People like this see fun as evil. A few years ago, I'm sure you remember it, and I don't know where you were on the issue, and it doesn't really matter, it's, it's in the past, but Southern Baptists decided to boycott Disney because homosexuals visited the park and because they provide health care to same-sex couples. Um, by the way, Apple Computer does the same thing, and I don't see anybody boycotting the iPhone. I'm not condoning any of that. But the Disney boycott, let me tell you, accomplished nothing other than making children feel guilty for wanting to watch cartoons and go to Disney World. I remember serving in a church where children wanted to were asking me what was wrong with Disney because of this boycott that churches seem to get caught up in. And it, it's just so easy for Christians to become misguided. No wonder that we have such an absence of young people in churches because we've spent more time boycotting things than we have promoting things. <laughs> Can I say something? If you say no, I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> We have no record of Jesus boycotting anything. Jesus was fully engaged in the culture of his day. He spoke the truth. He spoke against things. But he was popular at parties. The everyday person loved him. Why did they love him? Did they love him because he was leading the latest campaign against something? No. Did they, did they love him because he was solemn, boring, and had no fun? No. It was because he was a joyful person. He was a friend of sinners. He included everybody. Deadbeats aren't known for their party invitations. Friendly people are. I want to celebrate everything. I think of the Old Testament people who celebrated everything. Every other week it seemed like there was a feast of celebrating something. I'd like for us to become a church that sets milestones. And when we reach those milestones, we celebrate and rejoice for what God has done. This morning, the baptisms was a, was a milestone. I, I, don't, I don't know if you got that. If you didn't, I'm telling you, it was a milestone in the life of this church. People who came together in 1956 or 1957 
had no idea that this would happen someday, had no idea what would become of Tusculum in 2013. In 1957, people probably wondered if the world would even be here in 2013. And for all these years, this church has collected money to go to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which has gone to China. And now China's right here in her own baptistry. Isn't it wonderful? What a milestone. Praise God. It's wonderful. Not only do I want to celebrate everything that's an accomplishment for God's kingdom, I want to do it with people who want to celebrate. A few weeks ago, some of our ladies asked if we could put out this nativity scene. I said, of course. Why would I say no? Because we've got Joseph, we've got Mary, and we have Jesus. Why would I say no? Oh, but it's on the Lord's Supper table. It's his table. Right? Let's celebrate. We have reason as Christians to celebrate. I think of the Jewish people who know how to celebrate. And then I shake my head at Christians who just know how to suck the life and joy. And people who know, Christians who know how to squelch laughter and celebration. And I don't want to be one of them. And I don't want to associate with them. I'm 47. I don't know how many years I've got left. But I want to be known as a joyful person because I have a reason to have joy. I've had my share of sorrow. I've had my share of loss. I've grieved about things that you don't know about. But I can say this, the overall tone of those things is overshadowed by the joy of Christ. What's the source of God's love? Will you turn with me to John? Excuse me, the source of joy is God's love. The source of joy is God's love. Will you turn with me to John chapter 15? As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So ladies and gentlemen, without God's love, there would be no joy. Jesus is the personification of God's love, which brings joy. That's the source of it all. And Jesus said, love others if I have loved you so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be full. So where's the joy meter with you these days? It's wherever the love meter is. And if the love meter is a little low, then the joy meter is going to be a little low. Because the source of joy is what? Love. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for the joy of Jesus. We know we don't deserve it. And how in the world you've chosen to love us is beyond me, beyond anyone here. But indeed, you have chosen to love us. For that, we're grateful. Help us to be a church of joy. Help us to rejoice when great things happen. We know that uh, the cycle in the Bible has grief and then later joy, sad, sad times and then later joy, despair and then later joy. So we know that every day with Jesus will be a better day than yesterday. If there's somebody here, Lord, that's dealing with a difficult time right now, please remind them that joy will come and that the downtime will pass. Lord, if there's anybody here that needs to make a decision for you, let them do that tonight. My prayer in Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing.
Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life, my hope, my glory, my all. This is 296 in the hymnal. Wonderful Master, in joy and in strife, on him you too may call. Jesus is Lord. 